Ok. Então, boa noite a todos. Gostava de ver ali o nosso amigo Julian. Boa noite a todos. Uh, como sabem, esta é uma realização da Associação para o Desenvolvimento da Cooperação em Arqueologia Peninsular, a ADCAP, com a sua sede no Porto. Está agora, ultimamente, a retomar as suas atividades. Já vem desde 1997. E hoje temos a honra de ter um dos maiores para historiadores da Europa, o professor Julian Thomas, da Universidade de Manchester, que nos vai falar sobre, em inglês naturalmente, sobre o seguinte tema. Eu até o tinha também traduzido e divulgado, mas agora uh, o que eu tenho aqui à minha mão é a uh, versão inglesa. Steps Toward an Archaeology of Life. Portanto, o professor Julian Thomas é uma pessoa bem conhecida do mundo arqueológico, é professor de catedrático de Arqueologia da Universidade de Manchester, no Reino Unido, estudou nas universidades de Bradford e de Sheffield e foi, primeiro, foi inicialmente professor em Lampeter e, e em Southampton, nestas duas universidades. Publicou numerosos livros, quase todos conhecemos, incluindo Archaeology and Modernity, que aliás apresentou no Porto em 2004, na nossa faculdade, The Birth of Neolithic Britain, e de colaboração com uma colega, uh, Case Ray, uh, Neolithic Britain, The Transformation of Social Worlds. Mas uh, tem muitos outros livros, não é? Que é agora uh, demasiado estar a citar. Uh, fez continuamente escavações desde há muitos anos e continua, uh, nomeadamente esteve ligado a um projeto muito importante, o Stonehenge Riverside Project, e está agora a dirigir um programa de trabalho de campo no Here Fortune com Case Ray. Um, um, também é co-investigador de um projeto Time e uh, este projeto procura uh, afinar a questão cronológica por meios radiométricos para a Grã-Bretanha e para a Irlanda no quarto milénio e no terceiro milénio antes de Cristo. É membro da Sociedade dos Antiquários de Londres, portanto o nome tradicional de Society of Antiquaries of London, e membro também do Council of the Royal Anthropological Institute. Portanto, o resumo que o professor Julian Thomas nos enviou, leio aqui num instante para não tirar tempo à conferência, uh, Steps Toward an Archaeology of Life. There is presently a tension in prehistoric archaeology between the essentializing of past collective identities and the desire to overcome humanism and anthropocentrism. Was the Neolithic, for instance, simply the cultural and economic apparatus of people who shared a particular genetic inheritance? Central to this discussion is the status of archaeological evidence and material things in general, adopting Tim Ingold's argument that all things are in life within an animate world, it is possible to reconsider that character of the social entities that we investigate. So I'm going to close my sound and give the word to Professor Julian Thomas, my, my good friend. And, uh, and uh, I want just now to uh, thank him for the kindness of giving as uh, uh, his talk. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for that, uh, that very kind introduction. Can I just check that everyone's hearing me all right before I go any further? Okay, then I'm going to share my screen and put that on. Right, okay. So it's a great honor and a real pleasure to be invited to speak to your association. How I wish I could be there in person rather than locked in my study at home this evening. I wanna to talk tonight about the particular approach that I'm taking to recent developments in archeological and anthropological thinking, guided to some extent by the particular aspects of prehistory, the particular problems in prehistory that I'm concerned with. To be specific, I find myself keeping coming back to this question of 
what exactly the Neolithic might represent and what we might mean by a Neolithic society. So I take it as axiomatic that the Neolithic amounted to far more than just the cultural baggage of a particular group of people who happened to share either a set of economic practices or a genetic inheritance. The Neolithic, it seems to me, is a paradigm example of a more than human phenomenon, although clearly not one that could have existed in the absence of humans. A Neolithic society then is one in which the temporalities of people, things, animals and plants become spliced or splinted together, constituting a more enduring social form. If each of these beings could be understood as a line extending through time and space, then the, in the Neolithic, these lines become more closely bundled and entangled together through bonds of care, dependency, habit, and domination. This lends the social form greater durability as the lives of some of these entities extend longer than others. And this provides a context for the practice of delayed return economic practices. We might argue then that these social arrangements were the precondition for agriculture rather than simply its outcome. So more than just being a multi-species community, a Neolithic society hybridizes the worlds that are made by people and animals, plants and materials. And all of these entities have histories of their own, which are drawn on and drawn into the present. So a Neolithic society is one that continually manifests its multiple histories. Now, Anna Singh here has remarked that the social is made up of entangling relations with significant others. And it follows that we need to think of societies as being composed of more than intersubjective relations between human beings. This in turn demands that we have to set aside any categorical division of the world into culture and nature, human and non-human, object and subject. We might perhaps talk about a cyborg Neolithic, although I want to suggest that the other than human elements of the Neolithic represented more than just prostheses. They're more like partners, although far from being equal ones. Now, I'd also like to suggest that at another level, the Neolithic represents an example of what Timothy Morton refers to as a hyper object. Hyper objects are phenomena that are massively distributed in time and space. Hyper objects like, for instance, global warming are pervasive in their effects, which are nonetheless experienced locally, and yet their totality can't be apprehended at the local level. As in the case of global environmental change, these hyper objects are often more than human in character. They extend beyond the human scale and involve constituents and consequences that may not be apprehended or appreciated by people alone. So in order to address these questions, I argue that what is required is what I'm going to call an archaeology of life. And an archaeology of life is one that attempts to find a common framework for investigating the diversity of beings that make up a world. In this respect, I'm very aware that I'm not alone in seeking out this kind of an approach. This evening, I'll be hoping to outline what is perhaps a middle position between, on the one hand, some of the new materialisms, like particularly symmetrical archaeology, which is these people here, and the important criticisms of those approaches that have been articulated by John Barrett here on the other. In doing this, I'll be using the works of Tim Ingold here as my guide, which seemed to me the most potent ev evaluation of how it is that the world is lived. The key point that I'll be seeking to make throughout is that there's a crucial and fundamental relationship between the way that we think about life and the way that we understand the character of archaeological evidence. Now, I think it's arguable that for the past 40 years or so, 
archaeologists have been working through the implications of Ian Hodder's argument that material culture is active rather than passive. Previous academic generations had held that artifacts represented the tangible manifestation of collective cultural norms or the physical component of strategies of adaptation to external environmental conditions or to internal changes in social composition. What does shift towards the identification of material culture as something that's meaningfully constituted indicated that the significance of things is not self-evident and that they have to be carefully interpreted in context. Objects then within societies could be deployed in social strategies and used to construct identities or social positions. Yet, because things might have unintended or unrecognized meanings, they were capable of escaping their makers and their users and generating effects that were unforeseen and independent. And while Hodder's original reflections were principally concerned with the role of artifacts as material symbols, they introduced into archaeological discourse the, um, uh, the proposition that objects are not simply the outcome or the byproducts of human behavior and that they can generate outcomes of their own. So objects don't just have things done to them, objects do things, they have effects. So while people make things, things also to some extent make people too. A different but complementary set of arguments was also being developed within the philosophy of science and technology, where Michel Serre pointed to the capacity of material things to stabilize and canalize social relationships, facilitating the routinization of practices at an unconsidered level. Since architecture and artifacts are often more durable than human beings, they can potentially provide a long-term framework or scaffolding for the reproduction of social order, particularly in the absence of enduring uh, political institutions. So for that reason, in non-state societies in particular, uh, things like material culture may be of critical importance to the way in which social relations are reproduced. Building on those arguments, Bruno Latour and Shirley Strum pointed to the extensive deliberation, negotiation and testing required in any kind of social interaction that takes place within primate societies because they lack the formal traditions of, contact, of conduct that human societies have and they also lack constructed artifact, art, uh, artifactual worlds. So the consequence is that it's as if these poor old baboons have to begin again, uh, re-establish contact every time. They don't have the same opportunities for habitual structures uh, of social life that we do within human societies. So the point about objects is that alongside enduring social institutions, they remove much of the hard work by providing an unacknowledged framework for everyday life in their different ways. All of these perspectives lead us to the conclusion that social life is not separate from the material world and that artifacts are intrinsic to sociality. Perhaps even more crucially though, John Barrett has consistently argued that the recognition that artifacts are never merely the products of social life is absolutely fatal for the long established concept of the archaeological record. This notion is ultimately attributable to Gordon Child, who stipulated conditions for uh, the remnants of the past to constitute a, a legible record, something that can be the basis for archaeological interpretation. But for Lewis Binford, the notion of the archaeological record implied that archaeological evidence represents a fossil record of the operation of an extinct society, which reflects all of the other structures of that same society. However, Barrett notes that artifacts and art 
architectures are actually the settings and media through which social life is conducted and reproduced, and that they're continually reworked and modified in the course of the process. So they're not things which are simply flung out by uh, the conduct of social life. They're actually intrinsic to the way in which that life is, is carried forward. And it follows that from this, that our evidence is not just a record. It can't be a record of past events, but a surviving component of a past material reality. As a result, he's at times referred to his approach as an archaeology of inhabitation, concerned with the material conditions that were at some time in the past occupied by various forms of human agency. Now, I want to concur with his insight here, but I also want to push it rather further, as you'll see later on as I go forward. But in passing, I'd also like to note Tim Ingold's view of this idea of a material record, because he, what he says is that things are never just parts of a record, they are themselves a record of their own ontogenesis. And I think this draws our attention to the way that things are never static, and indeed that materials are continually flowing into and out of configurations as artifacts, buildings, landscape features, or whatever, however fast or however slowly that takes place. So for Ingold, a thing is its movements. And I think immediately you can see that there's a little bit of a tension between what Barrett is saying on the one hand and what Ingold is saying on the other. And it's really that tension that I want to draw on and develop as we go forwards. Now, according to Bruno Latour, it's arguable um, that we can take this idea of the role of material things in social life a step further and to come to the point of view in which societies are equally composed of humans and various kinds of non-humans who together represent or constitute what he calls actor networks. Therefore, he goes uh, on to say that objects represent fully fledged social actors and any significant happening in the world is the outcome of the working together of heterogeneous networks or assemblies of different kinds of entities, human, non-human, and so on and so forth. So humans never achieve anything at all in isolation. An agency is always something that's distributed in networks of one kind or another. But the point is that as soon as Latour moves from the notion of artifacts uh, as active to artifacts as social actors, we've actually taken a step from active material culture to object agency, a concept that was developed entirely independently and in a rather different way during the 1990s by Alfred Gell. Both Gell and Latour were then influential in what Ewa Domanska refers to as a return to things within the humanities, a growing imperative to take the corporeal seriously, which really, I suppose, emerges from around the turn of the millennium onwards. For Domanska, this is all about a rejection of constructivism and anthropocentrism. But it takes also from Bill Brown a desire to stop seeing objects as windows through which we can apprehend history, society, and culture, and instead to value the things themselves. So we need to stop trying to look beyond the things to something more important or more interesting that they're leading us towards, and instead say the things themselves are of importance. Brown argues that the social lives of things are not just concerned with the way in which they circulate between human beings, but also with the way in which they do work in maintaining and reproducing a world. Now, coming from a background in literary studies, Brown's convergence with Latour is really remarkable. And I think you took, put the two things together and they really uh, set the scene for an archeological response to this material turn, so-called. Now, in practice, this initially took the form of what's referred to as symmetrical archeology, span which embroiders on two of the various themes 
that have been set forth by Bruno Latour here. The first is the need to overcome the conceptual binaries that are characteristic of modern thought. So culture versus nature, mind versus body, essence versus substance, and so on. But the second is a rejection of anthropocentrism and human exceptionalism. And this, they say, is to be achieved by an analytical leveling in which all entities are to be given equal consideration, uh, including humans. The effect is a kind of an ontological humility intended to develop a renewed, res renewed respect for material things, because of course, we depend on those things for our world, uh, for our very being, uh, and a consideration of our ethical relationship to material things as well. However, it has been argued by some that this imperative to balance the relationship between humans and non-humans nevertheless leaves the polarity between the two in place. So it still ends up with a divided world. Now, the means by which symmetrical archaeology seeks to achieve this analytical leveling is through what's been referred to as a flat ontology. And this, I'd have to say, is a term that I'm actually a bit ambivalent about, because it seems to me that it can actually refer to a whole series of different things. The, the very phrase can, can be taken in entirely different ways. And some of those things I'm very much in sympathy with, and others I'm really not at all. I think the difference arguably hinges on two different senses of flatness, which in practice, I think, sometimes get flated, conflated with each other. Craig Cipolla has recently reconstructed the history of the debate uh, on flat ontologies in, in a really very useful way. And as he notes, it begins with the philosopher of science, Roy Bascar, who actually uses this term flat ontology in a rather pejorative way. Bhaskar rejects a view of the world in which everything is equally a current. Everything is available, everything can be seen, and everything has readily self-evident qualities. He prefers instead a depth ontology in which there are forces and causes at work that are not directly observable and which need to be inferred through their effects. So being a philosopher of science, he's saying, well, of course, there are things like gravity. Uh, there are all kinds of forces at work in the world that aren't purely directly observable as objects just lying around in the world. Now, by contrast, Manuel de Landa positively evokes a flat ontology to propose a form of analysis in which we don't assume the importance or centrality of any entity before we begin our analysis. This may prove to be, you know, things rather may be entirely different from each other, but we should nonetheless subject them all to the same kind of scrutiny. However, in one account of Bruno Latour's work, he might be approving a kind of flat ontology, which is very similar to that which is identified by Bascar in which all of the actors in a network are effectively equally important, whether human or non-human, none has any kind of, of causal priority. So we, we potentially have a view of the world in which everything is equivalent, everything is the same as everything else. Everything is simply an actor and, or an actant, and everything is simply processing and translating and so on and so forth. Now, how do we get at unpacking this question of a flat ontology? Well, I think it's conventional to draw a distinction between ontology as our understanding of how things are in the world and epistemology by which we mean uh, the philosophical means by which we can acquire that understanding. But I think we can take things a little further by uh, drawing attention to another distinction which is made by Martin Heidegger between the ontological and the ontic. For Heidegger, ontology is concerned with those aspects of reality that are primordial and fundamental, while the ontic relates to the empirical and measurable characteristics of the particular things that surround us in a particular moment. The distinction between the two 
is what he refers to as the ontological difference. And he says that this is something that has been forgotten for the most part by Western philosophy. And it lies at the, the ground of all the problems that Western philosophy is encountering. Because we make the mistake, he says, in forgetting this difference of imagining that we can move seamlessly from the description of a current things around us to the nature of being in general. So I think that the confusing thing about this term flat ontology is that it might be referring to a depthless universe, or it might be referring to the way in which particular things don't necessarily enjoy any kind of, of particular privilege within that universe. And there I think lies our confusion. So it's entirely possible to reject, say, a humanism that proposes that the essential qualities of humankind are universal and exist outside of time and space, while at the same time upholding a view of the phenomenal world as something that is stratified in a whole series of different ways. So you can have flat ontology A without necessarily having flat ontology B. And in practice, many of those uh, thinkers who do propose a flat ontology in the sense of arguing uh, that the differences between things in the world are just ontic, rather than being fixed in the unchanging character of the universe, are also at the same time imagining a stratified reality. So here you're combining a flat ontology in one sense with a depth ontology in the other. So for instance, Graham Harmon here uh, argues that material objects have depths, they have withdrawn and inaccessible cores, and they only interact through their sensual exteriors. So too, assemblage theorists uh, like Manuel de Landa or Gilles Deleuze distinguish between inorganic, organic, and anaplastic registers or strata, they actually use the term strata, so that's pretty damn stratified, uh, which can nonetheless be applied, uh, approached using similar conceptual tools. And further, they also have a view of the generation of difference in the world, which involves the virtual, the intensive, and the actual. So again, this is a stratification of existence. So I want to argue that a kind of soft, flat ontology, although, as I say, I'm quite concerned about using that term at all, doesn't commit us to the view that everything is much the same as everything else, or that existence represents a featureless plane of accessibility. On the contrary, I want to see the world as something that's rich and complex and variegated and distinguished by a whole series, a whole plurality of differences. And one of those differences is the various developments associated with the emergence of humankind. And as an archeologist, I wanna study humans. I'm interested in all of the things that are concerned with human development and the things that humans have done. I just don't wanna see all of those things in isolation from all of the other things that are going on in the world. I think we foreclose on the possibility of understanding human development if we assume that the distinctiveness of humanity is fixed and pre-given at an ontological level, something that's written into the structure of reality even before we begin our analysis. Now, in seeking this leveling between humans and non-humans, symmetrical archaeology emphasizes one aspect of uh, post-humanism, but I think potentially it also neglects another one. Because during the period around the turn of the millennium, archaeologists were very concerned with the issue of personhood and the critique of modern conceptions of the human subject. In particular, the Western modern individual understood as something that's rational, unencumbered, an autonomous agent was identified as something that's actually both culturally specific and a kind of a regulatory fiction. This image has been progressively undermined 
by romanticism and psycho psychoanalysis, uh, addressing the idea of the unconscious, by the Marxian notion of ideology, by the post-structuralist dismantling of the ego, and by theories of becoming that render the person as a process rather than a fixed or bounded entity. But I think despite this, um, the way in which objects have been valorized sometimes in, in current archeology span uh, has been by rendering them as isolated, freestanding individual entities endowed with an agency which is either their own or deferred from humans. So objects are given a, a value by turning them into kind of surrogate humans. Part of the problem here is the view that agency is the possession or attribute of an entity or a person or a thing, even if it can only be exercised in relation to other things. Now, I want to stress that agency, power and responsibility are always relational and are always confederate and that there's no position outside of our worldly entanglements from which anyone or anything can act. But at the same time, I'm very mindful of Ruth van Dyck's re recent argument that flat ontology has a potential and troubling ethical implication. She says, if we lavish respect on objects, do we then cease to care for people? And do we forget about social justice? Now, I think one answer to this is to follow Michel Foucault and to argue that just because everything is relational, it doesn't follow that these relations are homogenous or balanced in any sense, or even that they have any center or focal point. These circuits of relationality have knots and blocks and resistances as well as flows, and this always makes them asymmetrical. You're always set, set within a relationship or a, a nexus of relationships, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you have complete freedom or necessarily any freedom at all. Every element within an assemblage or a meshwork is both enabled and constrained and afforded a distinctive set of potentials by virtue of its relational involvement. The way that those potentials are exercised is still a matter of ethics and politics, even if action is never an autonomous burst of intentionality beamed in from outside of this relational ne nexus. Moreover, the elements that make up these networks are not static blobs that pulse with energy and agency. They're always movements or lines or flows or histories. So as Ingold notes, they're never just or we are never just interacting. The various elements that make up a network are never just interacting. They're corresponding, moving in concert under conditions of total immersion in the world. And this is, I think, a rather lo lovely image that gives a sense of that. Um, this is from Jacques Cotillard's film, Rust and Bone. And here, Marianne Cotillard is precisely corresponding with a killer whale. They're not set over and ap apart from each other, interacting they're actually corresponding, moving together. Now, in describing organisms and materials as lines of becoming, Ingold begins to break down the distinction between the thing and its relationships, thus obviating the question of whether the objects come first or whether the, uh, the, the relations come first. They have a, an equiprimordial condition. He rejects the Cartesian view of material substance as inert, and instead presents a world in which everything is vibrant and in motion at different spatial scales and at different temporal speeds. If things are at once fundamentally embedded in a relational world, and at the same time continually in a state of movement, continually in a flux, it's no longer necessary to in install some kind of life force or entelechy into them to enable them to move and to do things and to have effects. It's not so much that life is something that is installed into objects. Objects and people and animals and plants are in life in the sense of being caught up continually in the flows and fluxes 
of the world's continuous coming into being. Everything moves, everything flows, everything undergoes morphogenesis. So this is a vitalist universe in which everything is alive, even if organisms and non-organic entities may be alive in rather different ways. And this is a point that I'm coming back to. As Jane Bennett puts it, life is a restless and self-altering field of processes, flows, and shifting assemblages of human and non-human components. But can we talk about non-organic life? Is it just the organic that is really and properly alive? When we look at geology, it's clear that matter is always in process, even if the matter flow may be exceptionally slow at some times. And clearly, in processes like the formation of soils, organic and inorganic components are mixed up. They become the different ingredients and materials of the assemblages of life. Equally too, hydrological and atmospheric strata are composed of flows of matter and energy. So what we commonly think of as inert matter can exhibit complex non-linear forms of behavior that may involve novel kinds of self-organization, bringing difference into the world in ways that are chaotic rather than deterministic. But having said that, John Barrett raises the very important point that organisms and inorganic entities operate in quite different ways. He says, non-living things tend towards their lowest possible energy state, while living things actually dissipate energy as a means of sustaining their own growth and development. He argues then that biological evolution describes a stratified trajectory which culminates with the emergence of complex multicellular organisms. Now I kind of agree with him, but I kind of disagree with him. The distinction that he's making is of really great importance, but I nonetheless want to resist the categorical division of the world into the living and the non-living. And this is because there's a danger of rendering the latter as static or as an externality, an environment within which life makes itself at home or a set of resources that are there for it to consume. It's also because I think in practice, the organic and the inorganic form a continuum rather than a fundamental bifurcation of the world, even if the analytical division between the two is both useful and important. Manuel de Landa, for instance, describes the way that under far from equilibrium conditions, um, you can see the creation of things that he calls bioids or chemical systems that are sensitive to small fluctuations resulting in oscillating behaviors. And these can represent what are called chemical clocks that pulse regularly and are in some ways similar to the kinds of chemical processes that actually take place within organisms. So there are continuities between the pre-organic or the non-organic and the organic. And Gilbert Simenden has discussed the way in which the creation of a cellular membrane encloses chemical processes that may have existed prior to the emergence of cellular life uh, and transforms those already existing processes in such a way as to establish the conditions of the spatiality and temporality of organisms. So part of the importance of stressing a continuum, a continuity between the non-organic and the organic is that on the long time scale, organic life must have emerged out of non-organic systems. This is this kind of primal soup that we were always talking about, out of which life emerged. But beyond this, there's a genuine gray area between life and, and non-life. So there are entities that scientists aren't sure whether they want to call living things or not. For instance, viruses, um, there's a continuing debate among scientists about whether these are alive or not. A virus then is a nucleic acid with RNA or DNA encased in a virus encoded protein capsid. But a virus can't reproduce itself independently. 
It needs to hijack the metabolic and replicative processes of a host cell in order to reproduce. But nonetheless, the processes by which viruses proliferate are broadly Darwinian in character. And that's why I'm sat here and you're sat there, because we're in the middle of a pandemic. Now, this suggests that the vibrant world of materials and organisms is one that we could divide up in a whole series of different ways. And to some extent, it's arbitrary which one of those divisions we choose to make the prime division. We could make a division between the living and the non-living, between the organic and the inorganic, between the vertebrate and the invertebrate, uh, between things that do and don't have a central nervous system, between sentient and non-sentient, between linguistic and non-linguistic and so on. And all of these are significant uh, distinctions and identify a sense of entities that behave in very distinctive ways. But the point I'm wanting to make is that where we privilege one of these distinctions over the others, we end up placing one set of entities in a center, and these tend to be the active beings which we understand as being at the center of the cosmos, and we then surround them by lesser, more passive entities, which are relegated to the status of being the environment. So this creates a picture of an inanimate world, which is inhabited by animate life. Whereas I'm wanting to suggest instead that the whole thing is actually in motion the whole time. Now, Ingold suggests that we should re review our traditional conception of an organism as a bounded and sutured entity that stands proud from its surrounding world, and think of it instead as a ramifying web of lines of growth and becoming. So the world is not a container surrounding a set of freestanding entities, but a domain of entanglements. There is no ultimate division between organism and environment. All of these things are leaking and absorbing. They're inhaling and exhaling. They're consuming and excreting. They're growing and exfoliating. They're living, dying, and so on. So life doesn't begin and end with organisms. And geology, biology, and technology are always going to overlap to a greater or lesser extent. Organic, and inorganic life are both animate and both are social as well. As I mentioned at the start, this has very significant implications for the way in which archaeologists understand the evidence that they're confronted with. We've seen already that material things aren't just a record, they aren't just the output of the society, they don't just represent uh, the end point of the doings of past persons. But nor are they, I want to suggest, simply the material settings or media through which humans enacted their purposes or exercised their agency. They're similarly not just inert resources that they drew upon, transformed and consumed. On the contrary, things are integral to social action, as I've been trying to suggest when I say that Neolithic societies are cyborg communities. So things and materials resist human designs, and humans have to work with them rather than just upon them. They have to accommodate their movements and effects. And much the same is true of plants of animals, which have processes, cycles, rhythms, and movements of their own, which become part of the fabric of these hybrid communities of humans, plants, animals, and things. Barrett argues that the forms of life that we deal with in the past moved, worked, and knew their worlds from within contexts that were provided in part by the material conditions within which they found themselves. But I worry that this renders um, uh, those material conditions as relatively passive and powerless containers of life rather than dynamic ingredients of forms of life and social processes. Archaeological things then are not a reflection or representation of a past, past society, they're actually integral fragments of a past society. 
Now, this potentially has profound consequences for the way in which we understand archaeological evidence. Archaeological materials are always incomplete. They're always, in a sense, haunted by the absent presence of the people who are implied by the artifacts, of the animals who are represented only by their bones, and by the plants which are only present in the form of charred husks. But if we take the view that societies are hybrid entities composed of people, creatures, and things, our material actually constitutes a fragmentary portion of a past social formation. An archaeology of life, then, is a more than human archaeology, concerned with the changing ways in which these various constituent elements of the social, with their diverse potentials and temporalities, became bound together meshed and unraveled, creating the possibility for novel forms of existence and expression and diverse historical trajectories. So bringing this to some kind of a conclusion, I've been trying to argue that we've struggled with the notion of active material culture because we've attempted to accommodate it to a modernist framework of autonomous individuals, inert matter and conscious mental processing. Material things are active because everything is always in motion, growing, decaying, living, dying, and so on. And everything is capable of having effects, impacts, and consequences at some spatial or temporal scale. But things aren't agents in the sense that they aren't freestanding entities capable of effecting change through their own sovereign intentionality. But then maybe people aren't entirely that either, if we accept the kind of confederate or distributive model of agency proposed by Jane Bennett. Certainly, some kinds of beings have the ability to intervene reflexively in the flows and currents of the world, but this capacity is itself emergent, situated, embedded, and graded, rather than warranting a fundamental divide between humans and other kinds of creatures. Effectively, I'm arguing not for a, a kind of hard flat ontology, but for a kind of ontological naturalism, which tries to, to apply the same principles to inorganic, organic and human systems, while recognizing that real and significant differences between different kinds of beings have developed within uh, particular and specific contingent sets of circumstances. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Julian, for this extremely rich uh, lecture. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do is to uh, ask if anyone wants to ask you questions. Uh, if uh, people have any difficulty in English, although my English is not very good, I can translate. Uh, Vitor, por favor, há, oh, novamente está um eco enorme do teu lado. Enquanto há uh, uma certa indecisão, I would, uh, I would like to ask uh, Julian, uh, if it is possible, I don't know if I'm, I'm asking too much, to send us, to send me uh, your text, the text you read, you have read, because it is very rich. I tried to take some notes, but in a different language, surely uh, it's difficult. And uh, I don't know if you have already the idea of publishing it any in any uh, journal because if it, you have not <laughs> <laughs> i would like very much to include it if it possible naturally uh, in uh, the journal we have in the, the society of anthropology okay it, it is so rich that we need to read it quietly in order to uh, think about uh, it because you conjugate 
uh, series or different positions you uh, you uh, reason about each one and try to find your own way in the middle of a complex situation where we are. And uh, that's very rich and interesting to read calmly and then to try to, in a, sort of, in a, in a way, answer. Yeah, I'd, I'd be delighted to send it to you. I, I should explain that what, what is happening here is I'm in the process of writing a book about what is a Neolithic society. And this is really one of the theory chapters in that book, um, which I've not really started reading. I'm, I'm in the, the phase of um, getting my ideas together for what I think. So I'm, I'm trying to, to work through this issue of life and how I, as, I, as you exactly said, how I find my position in relation to all these debates that are going on presently. And that yes. you know, really this is, I've sat down in the past few days and tried to put into, on, onto paper exactly what I'm thinking about all of these different ideas and then present it to you. So as you say, it's, it probably is extremely dense and I'm sorry for that. Um, but it, it's, as I say, I, I hope it's of interest because it is this attempt to um, negotiate a position within a whole series of debates which are going on at present. That, that's what is uh, extremely interesting in your in your talk, it's very dense, but uh, uh, when we have the text to read it Absolutely. calmly, uh, I'm sure that uh, at least I speak by myself, uh, I have something to say uh, that maybe uh, is of interest also uh, as a dialogue between us. Well, absolutely. I, I, I'd really value that because to some extent, being the pandemic th this past year, this is what I've been working away at. Uh, and it's it's quite nice to get to the point where I'm starting to expose it to other people and see what they think. So I'd, I'd really very much value your views. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm going to ask again if anyone wants to, to raise any question about the dance uh, paper that uh, our friend and colleague uh, exposed. In a way, I am, and I always was, fascinated by the work of uh, our common friend, Tim Ingold. Surely. I'm in contact with him as I'm in contact with you. And uh, I admire him in the, this last volume, uh, correspondences. <laughs> it's a, a volume. It's a poetic. It book. is. It really a marvelous, is. A marvelous, a marvelous poetic book. And in fact, uh, Tim Ingold is a a poet and a philosopher. Sure. <laughs> you might argue that they're the same thing. So uh, <laughs> this is so so fascinating that um, uh, it's impossible uh, uh, practically for me to to be in uh, discordance with him because, uh, but, but at the same time, I understand that he comes from, from uh, a line of thinking of thought that is different from the one I've been uh, trying to explore these last 10, day, 10 years because I retired 10 years ago, precisely. And, um, uh, he is what we may call. I don't know if you if you if you know uh, about a, a small book uh, where he and the uh, uh, French anthropologist Philippe Descola oh yes enter into a dialogue. Uh, it's interesting because uh, Philippe Descola comes from the structuralist tradition of mm -hmm. Levi Strauss. Uh, he is when he is the, the main the principal disciple of Claude Lévi-Strauss, but of course he goes beyond that because Lévi-Strauss already was, was a genius and uh, Philippe Descolai is also very, very good. Uh, and uh, in that book, which is uh, a comparison between the two positions, um, we see that uh, the philosophy of um, 
Infinity Mingled is a vitalist one. Mm. A vitalist one. The, it comes from Bergson, Heidegger too, okay. Bergson and uh, Deleuze. And that's a line. That's a line of thinking. Um, well, but, but also Alfred North Whitehead. Also of Whitehead. Ah, okay. I think that's a really important element in, in that as well. Whitehead. Mm. Yes. You know, I've, I've got the book here. <laughs> oh, it's disappeared. I had it on the table a minute ago. Uh, process and reality. Process of reality. Process and reality. Uh, it's really important, really significant work. I'm troubled now. Where's it gone? Um, oh, perhaps that's it there. I've been in this room for too long. I don't know where <laughs> things are. Doing. It's always the same. We when we search for something, it is disappeared. It, it's it's uh, it's really important because he's very much from the. Um, English realist school of philosophy. And ah, okay, okay. Developing this very particular um, approach to life, to science in particular. And I, I think um, Tim Ingold's father was a scientist. Of course. It, it, and I, I think that there's, there's, there's something very interesting that happens in the way that Tim Ingold develops. He, he has that scientific background. He has an ecological set of concerns. Early on, he's very influenced by the early Marx as well, which I think yes, is yes, 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 yes. You know, the, um, the Hegelian Marx. And then, as you say, there are all these things. Um, phenomenology comes in at a particular point. And then finally, as you say, Deleuze. Um, I, I've been exploring uh, a different way of looking at things, um, but this would uh, take us to a long, a long path. So uh, <laughs> I don't want to occupy or to uh, use much of the time. But uh, my my way of thinking is uh, the idea that uh, after all, uh, we humans, human beings being entangled in this fluid uh, move, move uh, in movement world in constant movement world and where the objects of course are not just perceived elements but active elements in our in our way of dealing with the reality of course otherwise i wouldn't be an archaeologist because it's the essence of archaeology to to uh, to come from the idea that uh, artifacts or any kind of uh, material things that surround us, just they don't surround us. We interact with them continuously and more and more with artificial intelligence, probably we will enter into a new world where it's the things that will will interest uh, interact with us in the well, sense that's that another really interesting question because this, this thing of what's alive and what isn't um computer viruses are, are another really good example of that now, yes are they, are they yes, yes 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 life i have a friend since uh, my youth luis Muniz Pereira, who uh, practically was one one of the people that in, in introduced in portugal artificial intelligence mm -hmm. and is now a very international expert and uh, what he say, uh, tries is to uh, put uh, in a non-organic base mm -hmm. a machine uh, uh, a consciousness consciousness and even an ethics so it, they go until that point i think that um, that uh, after all um, we humans, we have something that detach us definitively from everything around. Uh, and that is the language. And uh, you know very well how important was Saussure 
and after associate all these linguists of the 20th century, Yomslev, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, the way uh, Freud discovered the unconscious and uh, the way it was reworked by Lacan. And uh, this thing, this particular difference makes an enormous difference. This make, made me start to think that probably the dichotomies we invented since the Western modernity, 17th century with the rationalism, etc., which are typically of Western world, are not so crazy because we need to separate first to put in correlation in relation after. And uh, the human being is the only being that may in fact um, have the conscience of, of death and many other things. And in the fact that we are, uh, when, we, when we are born in the moment of our, our coming to the world, we are already surrounded by words of our parents, of our family. And we start speaking. And in the moment we speak, uh, that would be a long conversation, but we differentiate definitively from other beings. No other objects or, or no other beings, even the big apes, are concerned with these problems that uh, put us together here now. They are not concerned. It's us. It's our problem. Uh, and in that way, we are different. But there is another problem. is that we are archaeologists. Being an archaeologist, I am always uh, with a specific site or a specific epoch or a specific time in the space. And knowing how much subtle, fast, moving, uh, complex is the world, the interaction between human beings, I must admit, of course, that the past that I need to construct, because we are constructing the past now, uh, is always a, an incomplete one. But that incompleteness is not is not something that should put us in a in a in a situation of of depression. We all humans are incomplete by the fact that we never never reach the total of the meaning. If we could reach the total of meaning, we would be God. So as long as we lost God. It's a very important thing. Well, but that also um, brings you back to that point about becoming. The incompleteness is inevitable if you're in a process of becoming yes. rather than achieving a state of being. Absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, incompleteness is the, 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 the reality itself is incomplete. Uh, as in the video, video games, for instance, if mm. you have a video game, I, I don't like video games, but it's just an example. If you have a video game, you see that in the landscape of the video game, there is not programming, detailed programming of the environment. They just uh, make something that uh, seems to be an environment, etc., because it's not important for the game. So uh, it, reality is like that. Reality itself. Reality is something that we never reach entirely. I, I just, I'm, I'm always in a certain point of the time and space looking at the things. And uh, I never reach, I, I, can, I, cannot, I cannot put in a box of thought everything. So there is something always to escape me. And, um, and uh, this would occur with any human being in the Neolithic or in the Paleolithic or in the, any other epoch of, uh, of our history. So, um, the, my, but my problem is, I don't want to know, I don't want to know in detail 
how were people singing, interacting, uh, symbolizing, uh, because it was daily, daily, a daily movement, a daily a continuous negotiation. I imagine that as we do now in our society, and our society in a way is very, is very free, uh, and in a way is not free at all because we are much more subordinated to laws because it's more complex. So as long as complexity uh, increased, we needed to create more and more and more rules and laws and complexity of bureaucracy, et cetera, et cetera. But what I mean of, uh, with this is to accept the fragility of, of, of prehistoric archaeology. Mm. Things are mute, definitively. Things are mute. They were not just objects that people used. They, they interact with people, of course, but they are mute. And uh, we cannot talk with, with them. So the, 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 the main feature that characterizes the human being, it's possible, for instance, if I do anthropology, because I have some people which I can talk with, but in archaeology, in prehistoric archaeology, I don't have texts, but it's not a problem because having texts, I may have the imagination, the illusion that I understand. And it's very important to integrate the, the, the idea that I don't understand, that I, am, that I am not all, that the reality is not all. Yes, I think that's absolutely right. But we don't talk to the things. We can't talk to the things. But we don't talk to our own things either. So our relationship with those things that remain from a past world is not different from the relationship that past people had with those things. Of so course. We, we, we don't need to have the kind of relationship that we have with other human beings with those things in order to understand them. We understand them in the way that we understand our own things. Yes, yes, yes. And in, in a way. In that sense, you know, what I want to say is, you know, I'm optimistic about archaeology because I do believe that we're not confronted with something which is just a shell, just uh, a shadow of a past society. It is an integral element, a part of that past society that we engage with. And yes, that yes. engagement that we do as archaeologists is comparable to the engagement of past people in their material worlds. Yes. Uh, yes, in a way, things uh, things for the I, past can people. I, can I say something? Uh, there are two people Sorry. that are attending <laughs> um, for, uh, for uh, uh, asking uh, Julian Thomas. Um, uh, the first is Sarah, and uh, the second is Dulcinea. Um, pardon me, but uh, they are attending a lot of time uh, for, in, uh, for, for questioning. Uh, Sarah? Uh, uh, I don't know. Yeah, it's me. Good evening. Hello. Hello. Uh, uh, first, uh, Julian, let me thank you very much for... Uh, it was a very refreshing uh, talk you, you gave, and uh, I was delighted uh, with all the reference and all the, um, the thoughts you, you offered to us. And um, particularly, I have to thank you because I'm in the process of preparing a, a talk. That I, I was invited by, by Vitor also. Oh, very but, good. Uh, to, yeah, for another <laughs> association. And uh, actually, I'm kind of um, throwing out some thoughts about uh, technology in archaeology, okay. particularly coming from my field of so-called expertise, um, lithic technology. Mm. But uh, I'm interested in, in technology as, as a whole. Um, and... Um, I was glad to see that some of the references I'm using, you also mentioned them, like Tim Ingold, Foucault, and Michel Serres, Bruno Latour. Uh, and you gave me a lot of ideas for others that, that I have to, 
that I have to search, research, do some, some homework. But my point is that um, what I would like to have uh, question you and somehow uh, get a, a bit of advice from you mm -hmm. is that um, being an archeologist that uh, I, I work for a lot of years specializing on lithic, lithic technology. And uh, in, the, in the last five years, I, I, I I was invaded by such an enormous laziness around the subject. And um, because um, a lot of, of the thought around technology emerged precisely from uh, Paleolithic studies, from lithic technology, all the concepts of reduction sequence or chaîne opératoire, mm -hmm. as I prefer to call it. But I think that um, at least in that field, things got so much specialized that we don't look the other way. And we don't look what, what is being debated in anthropology, in ethnology, and in philosophy. Mm. And uh, I kind of see, um, I mean, I, 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 the other day I was listening to a, a conference from a, a colleagues. Uh, they were presenting a very nice uh, work about uh, transmission of knowledge in uh, lithic technology. But you know that the thing was so specialized, so focused on the, the orientation of the removal, the but, the, the, I mean, it's, it's such a speech that I, I, I don't see where it, it leads us. And frankly, um, I'm still fascinated by the subject of, of technology and particularly of stone tools. But I think that, um, it's somehow uh, uh, getting much crystallized, the thought around it. Too much focused on the methodology, I believe. Of course, there are refreshing works that uh, have a broader sense. But when I look at the papers that are, uh, many papers that are being published, I believe that somehow um, it's drifting away this, um, this um, thought about technology, particularly focusing on, on, on uh, lithic technology. And uh, what I would ask to you is that I'm also aware that some specialization is necessary. Sometimes we really have to go into the detail of the function analysis of the experimental archeology, span uh, all, but um, we can't just stay there. I mean, I, uh, I, I, I I feel there is a, um, a general lack of uh, just maybe reading some, something else, something more, and bring it to our own work on, on this, uh, because technology, it's a fantastic uh, uh, field of, uh, of, of, of study, but it's fantastic in the way you just put it. Uh, because you were talking about material things, you were talking about technology as well. And the way you put it, it's fascinating. The way I found it in much studies, it's um, sometimes boring and uh, I must say frustrating. Well, I wonder whether that's telling you that that area of studies is coming to a moment when it has to change, that there's a kind of an involution. Uh, a process of, you know, there's a great moment when things change, and then you go back to the more, um, the more precise working through of the ideas. So perhaps what you're identifying is a moment when technology studies, and particularly lithic technology studies, need a change. They need an injection of something new. Um, and the question is, what is that something new? I would say maybe look at someone like Gilbert Simenden. Yeah, uh, yeah, of course. I, I, I think that's that's where I'd go if I were wanting to, uh, to do something yeah, yeah, sure. technology at this, at this moment, and maybe that's the way through. Um, but also, again, Deleuze. I think there's a... Okay, okay. Tremendous... I, I, I am including a lot of uh, readings of uh, Simondon, and yeah. uh, there is another author that I think it's uh, very important. He was introduced to me by Vit uh, True Vitor, which is Bernard Stiegler. Oh, yeah. Uh, I also think he's, he's a 
good reference. But again, I have presented some of my thoughts in a, in a conference and they all look at me as a bit of an alien. So I'm not so sure. <laughs> I think you have to, you have to persevere. And you then have to show how it changes what you do. Um, and that's when you get the, the, the change, I think. When you've worked it through. But keep at it. Thank you very much. Uh, Dulcinea, um, you can ask. Hello. Hello. Uh, thank you, Julian, for being here. It's a and, pleasure. Uh, and thank you for the people that invited you and uh, brought you here, too. Uh, so I, um, I didn't understand all that you have said because uh, it's difficult in English, sorry. Really, really. <laughs> uh, and uh, maybe my question is not that important, but I will make it uh, anyway. So um, I have this um, love for objects. And uh, so I, when I saw that image about artistic objects, my mm -hmm. question is about that. So, um, if objects uh, and maybe parts of a picture, reality or world, have different levels of depth, uh, when they are together, uh, when they work together, or when they appear together, uh, it, their depth changes or not? Um, and this is uh, my uh, reflection, because if it keeps the same, the pictures that we see in order to understand it, we try to understand the levels. So we, we keep dividing it. But if they work together, uh, the picture maybe is the only thing that we can actually uh, show us the depth of each other when they are together. So how can we understand this? Um, and uh, my fear in this question is, are we not projecting uh, the world, our world to the past? Because now we have plenty of objects and we love them all. So maybe we want to see in the past this uh, idea that uh, we live with them and they are with us. Well, yes, but is it necessarily the case that our relationship with objects is the same as the relationship with objects of people in the past? And I would say it's actually quite different because I keep coming back to this issue of the difference between societies that do and don't have the state, the difference between societies that do and don't have um, institutions and the way in which objects bear a different kind of a weight if you're using them as the source of your social stability. So um, I, I, I think it's not a case of projecting our relationship with objects on, onto the past. It's saying, what can we know about the different kind of way that, that objects are integral to social relations in different periods. Um, so a, th there's a danger, I think, in, in saying, well, we've got a lot of stuff and they had some stuff. And so we're like them, but more so, and to seek a continuity in the way in which the material world develops. I think it, it's, it's, it's discontinuities, ruptures, changes in the way that people are um, with their things that we should perhaps be looking for um, rather than imagining that it's a, a simple process of escalation and evolution that leads us to to the world where we now have an awful lot of things and ian hodder has been talking about this a lot recently um, and he talks about the way in which things entrap us so that people start out from a position of a kind of innocence with very few things and they gradually become dependent on more things 
uh, and the things become dependent on them. And you get this cycle of escalation where now the, ob the, 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 uh, the average American family has something like 30,000 objects, whereas a hunter-gatherer has three objects. Um, the danger, I think, is, is seeing that as a single straightforward tra trajectory. Um, I don't, I'm just an escalation of the same relationship with things. I'm wanting to see the qualitative rather than just quantitative differences in the way that people and objects are together as you go through time. I don't know whether I'm answering your question, but <laughs> those are some those are some thoughts. Uh, thank, thank you, you. yes. There are, <laughs> there are more uh, questions in the public. Well, we are tired, I think, <laughs> with the material things and the objects <laughs> of every, every day, everyday lives and uh, with the virus do, um, I don't know if, uh, if, uh, if, if Vitor that I have interrupted <laughs> wants to, to to say something more. It's always useful to interrupt me because if I start <laughs> talking, I never, I never stop. <laughs> and uh, above all, after, after listening to everything that uh, Julian said, of course, uh, what I really would like <laughs> is to read the paper. I shall and, send it to you. Absolutely. I thank you very much for everything not only for this excellent lecture that you prepared for us, and uh, also by the fact that you send the paper, if you allow us to publish it as a first draft of your Ooh. chapter, yeah. of your future book, <laughs> it would be an honor, of course, and, uh, and important for us to, to think, because, uh, of course, uh, uh, Archaeology, archaeology in general, in general, and uh, prehistoric archaeology in particular, uh, always had problems and difficulties, importations uh, uh, from other disciplines. And uh, we always have this problem. We import many things and we export not so many things to other disciplines, in a, in a way. In a way. I, I think we worry about that a bit too much because I think the dialogue is really important with other disciplines. Of course. The, the problem is a problem of, uh, of, of, of funds, of funding, because sure. we have our method of work well established. We know how to do. We are glad when we can work mm. and uh, we know how to do. Uh, what didn't happen in my past when I was very young, archaeology in Portugal was very late. Now we know what we would like to do, but we don't have enough uh, funding. Uh, mm. The state, the Portuguese state is not able to, to funding. So most of archaeology in Portugal is made uh, by enterprises. And because it is forced by the law, when uh, people intervene in certain terrains, they need to to do excavations first, mm. but uh, it, it's a problem of, of, of funding because we, we, we I, I don't, I'm not uh, depreciating archeology span or prehistory or anything. Uh, every field of, of study is good to enter into the problematics of the human mm. and not only of the human, of course, of the world in general. Uh, any way is a good way. And our, our way is, a good, is as good as the others. I'm sure, and uh, what what we need to show uh, is is that in, in in what we write and try to convince more people to interest, because there are people 
when they speak about archaeology, they think that we are doing that in the sense of Foucault. And <laughs> of course, it's a different meaning. <laughs> Very interesting also, but completely different. So uh, we, we, we need to, to keep in, keep, also, we Europeans, because although the United Kingdom retired from the European Union, of course. Uh, <laughs> I, I hope that Don't in get the future, started on that. <laughs> I hope I hope so. Uh, we are we are we Portuguese, for instance. We search our sources of inspiration, both mm -hmm. in French uh, archaeology and so, but very especially in British or English, uh, uh, as you know because I think that um, the continental archaeology has uh, for a long time being very much, I mean prehistoric archaeology because historic archaeology is a different thing. They, they have history, they are in a, in a way uh, uh, an auxiliary discipline of mm -hmm. general history, but I mean uh, prehistory in the continental area for a long time has maintained uh, as a um, as a, a subsidiary discipline, uh, uh, not very, very important. And uh, in England, it's completely different. Uh, you were always connected, uh, uh, even because of your contacts with uh, American literature, literature and social anthropology in England, etc., etc. Uh, you came from a different tradition of interaction be between all these disciplines, and that is very important. So it's why, since my use. The first books that made me archaeologist, an archaeologist were the books by Gordon Child. Oops. That were translated in Portugal. And this made the difference. And since then, uh, I always tried to find the good archaeologists in England. <laughs> and and combi combining that with what I learned myself for my PhD yeah. uh, in uh, Br uh, Brittany. The school of Pierre Roland Chiot. Of course. Who, who, unfortunately, this school is practically dead now. Mm. Info, unfortunately. But it was the very, very good school where I learned mm. the complexity of the so-called megalithic phenomenon. Mm. Uh, that, that, was, that was very, very important for me to, to go there. And uh, I knew, of course, George Hogan, et cetera, et cetera, many people that go, went there. And from there, of course, I, I, I learned how to work. For instance, Professor Zhu, when he told us, Vitor, you don't need to excavate the chambers. You need to excavate all the mound, of course, but not only the mound. You need to excavate between the mounds. You need to outside the mounds. You need so a, a spatial archaeology. Archaeology turned into the space, and not an archaeology turned into the monument, or or of course into the object. And that's very important. But I don't know if I'm I'm fatigating you or people. <laughs> uh, just. Asking if anyone else want to intervene. They prefer to to observe, of course. The English is the problem of the languages, you know. Of course, of course. God made us this great problem. They divide, they divide, he divided us between languages and cultures and everything. I was thinking about Pierre, uh, Philippe Descola. Uh, Philippe Descola, you know, uh, by the comparative method in anthropology, made these four great ontologies the naturalist, animist, totemist, and analogist. And of course, it always it is interesting in a way that it makes us think that if we were so different in Middle Ages, or in the antiquity from what, what we are now. Uh, so, for instance, when Marguerite Yusnar made the memories of Adrian, 
she she committed an enormous it, it, it's, it is a danger to do that because not only she was a woman but on, also she was a contemporary and it's very difficult to put herself in the words of an old man like Adrian like Emperor Adrian in Rome but it's a very interesting uh, uh, <laughs> jump into the abyss <laughs> to understand the other right? to put it in the first in the first person of the verb in the in the in the personality of the other right? uh, is interesting in, in in a way sometimes literature literature and poetry uh, goes uh, goes before us uh, and uh, we need to follow uh, these uh, inspirations also not only in science and uh, of course in, in history but in all the Human, human activity and the literature is very, very important. You know, I, I'm, I'm now studying the seminar number six of Lacan. Uh, and uh, it's about desire, desire in general, of course, and its interpretation. And in a certain moment, Lacan was very, very, a very cultivated man. He uh, has seven lessons about Hamlet. And he connects the myth of Hamlet, the, the character of Hamlet, Shakespeare and Shakespeare Hamlet, with Oedipus. And this is very interesting to understand our cultural tradition, for instance. And uh, these things enrich us and open us for new universes. But you see how rich is the human universe it's incredible and for the good and for the bad of course i stop speaking because <laughs> i would be here all the time with the pleasure of seeing you again it would be so nice to just to talk face to face in the real world yes but there is also a certain joy when we meet by the internet. Oh, sure. Yeah. But for the first time, I am visiting your home. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you so much, Julian. You are it's great. A pleasure. You are great. You are really one of the greatest uh, prehistorians today. Oh, you're too you are really enrich enriching us enormously. Thank you. Thank you. I don't Thank know you. if uh, we can stop now. It's Maria Jesus who is in charge of. Uh... Good Thank night. you so much. <laughs> Good well, night. Thank you for having me. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you, Julian. It's been a pleasure. <laughs> Thank you.